Thank you. Good morning to all. Thank you for being here. After an introduction like that, I can't wait to hear what I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> I've been at London Business School uh, for 27 years now, and I've been teaching strategy and innovation for the, uh, all these years. Uh, and uh, when I was asked to give this speech, they, they told me, can you give a speech about agility? And I thought I'll talk about agility. But then they told me, but you cannot just have agility on your, uh, on your, on your slide because it's uh, like old-fashioned stuff. So how about continuous transformation? Okay, continuous transformation. That's what I'm like, here to talk to you about. So let me start out by saying that uh, you know, we've had the digital revolution of the last 20 years. It has had a tremendous effect on how we work, how we shop, how we live our daily lives. You know, I don't have to tell you that, but just because I'm an academic, I'd like to try a simple uh, multiple choice test on you to see whether uh, you can find answers to some of, the, some of these uh, questions on the kind of changes that have happened to us. So uh, you cannot vote, but you can raise your hand. I'm gonna give you a series of questions and uh, let's see what kind of answers you come up with. First question is the following. According to this professor at UCLA, uh, he's looked at uh, the effect of the internet on the human brain. What he's found is that um, exposure to the internet physically rewires the neural networks in the brain and changes the human brain. And one of the changes that uh, you see is that uh, the attention span of human beings has been reduced. In other words, people do not pay attention to you anymore. And my question to you is, uh, what do you think the average attention span of a 20-year-old individual is? Is it 30 seconds, 3 minutes, 10 minutes, or 30 minutes? How many think it's 30 seconds? Ah, uh, you have teenagers at home, don't you? <laughs> How many have, th uh, say, 3 minutes? 10 minutes? 30 minutes? The answer is 30 seconds, actually, which basically means I lost you about two minutes ago. <laughs> 30 seconds. They are, and this is, this is your employer, and this is your customer. I'll, I'll let you think what the challenge is uh, based on that. It's question number two, the US Department of Labor estimated that today's 18-year-old graduating from high school will have how many jobs, or how they expect to have how many jobs before they turn 40? Think about that, we're talking about for the next 20 years, how many jobs would they expect to have? How many think three to five? How many think five to eight? Eight to 10? 10 to 14? The answer is 10 to 14. 14 different jobs in the next 20 years? Again, think of the implication, huh? The challenge is not how do I track the best talent anymore? The challenge is how do you retain and keep them energized so that they don't just uh, change jobs or go somewhere else? According to a survey of European consumers, 97% of them cannot imagine life without what? If I ask you, what, if you, tell me the one thing you cannot imagine life without, what would you say? Probably your kids, your partner maybe, I don't know. How many think they said they, their partner and family? Nobody? <laughs> really? How many said the internet? How many said the mobile phone? How many the uh, car? Mobile phone, 97% cannot imagine life without their mobile phone. You know what the number was for their partner and family? 45%. 45% are these the number for can imagine life without my wife or husband. Fourth question, it's estimated that 53% of people in the UK suffer from nomophobia. Question is, what is nomophobia? Is it the fear of being alone? No. Anybody was for that? Yeah? How about the fear of being out of phone range? Come on. The fear of having no friends? The fear of losing their job? And you know what the answer is. Fear of being out of phone range. Can you imagine? We now have a disease associated with it. Nomophobia. In the survey of US consumers, 30% of adults said they use email to communicate. What percent of young people said the same? How many think zero? How many say two? How many 10%? How many 20%? The answer was 2%. 2%. What do they use, these kids? What do they use to communicate? WhatsApp, Snapchat, yeah. yeah I was talking to my 18-year-old nephew. He's at university in London. And, and we were talking about things. And he said, oh, my dad is very upset with me. I said, why is he upset? Because I, I don't answer his emails. I said, why don't you answer his emails? He said, well, I only look at them every month. 
every month. We think, <laughs> we think it's a mode of communication, you know. If you, if you still use email, you're probably my age. Last question. Before deciding what to buy, which website do consumers visit the most to do research on their intended purchase? How many think Google? And how many think Amazon? How many think Yahoo? How many think Go Compare? You don't even know what Go Compare is, do you? <laughs> it's actually Amazon. Do you know why? Why do they go to Amazon rather than uh, Google? Yeah, the reviews. They like to see the evaluations of other people. You know how people buy these days? In the good old days, if you wanted to buy something, you'll ask your partner, you'll ask your friends, what do you think about this? Now, we rely more and more on strangers for recommendations. Which hotel shall I stay? Well, you know, you want the website and check it out. You know, the, the, all the kind of websites that you can check out, hotels and things like that. You, li- you rely on, on strangers or on people who don't know for our purchasing decisions anymore. So, exciting stuff there, lots of changes, lots of changes, but you get my point, don't you? Well, uh, just in case, I said, what's my point? My point is we've had a lot of changes, okay? Lots of changes. And in particular, let me tell you that employees and customers these days, they tend to be less attentive. Remember that 30-second attention span? They tend to be much more informed on anything. You know, there's no worse job in the world than being a university teacher these days. You're teaching these kids, and while you're still talking, they are on their iPhone, on their laptop, and they can contradict what you say. When you say this company has annual revenues of 20 billion, they say, actually, professor, it's 22.3. <laughs> they are much more informed, less loyal, change jobs like that, much more connected, much less patient, they're not gonna sit around, more demanding, more vocal. If a customer doesn't get the service or quality they expect, what do they do these days? What do they do? In the good old days, maybe if you were really upset with a company and so on, you will call, send a letter. What do people do these days? They make a video, yes, and they go on YouTube. So one single customer interaction now, a bad customer interaction in your companies has the potential to become a global PR disaster for you. If you don't believe me, go and look at some, uh, my favorite video is the, the guy from United Airlines. Have you seen that video? They broke his guitar, and United refused to pay $5,000 for it and so on. And what did he do? He on a video. He he made a video of himself singing about how United breaks guitars and doesn't pay back and so on. Put it on YouTube. A couple of million hits later, United said, okay, I'll give you the $5,000. But think of the damage that causes to your company. So lots of changes. And can I just say, I think as a result of these changes, companies have responded. You know, you, I'm sure you've, you've done a lot of things, uh, lots of things. I mean, I, I really don't want to get into all the kinds of things that companies had to do in response to. You've, see, you've seen a shift. I think time has already talked about uh, the rise of the network organization from hierarchy to the network, from internal R&D. Now we see open innovation, where, uh, you know, from centralized financing, you have crowdfunding, from fixed pricing, you have dynamic prices. Instead of mass marketing, now we have a lot of customized marketing with all the big data they have on us. You know, it's a fascinating article. Um, I was reading yesterday about uh, this um, uh, data gathering uh, organization in Cambridge here in England that Donald Trump used, actually, the Republicans used to segment the U.S. population, not according to demographics, but according to political preferences and, you know, used it to great effect, you know, And all this data allows us to customize marketing, to customize products, to customize promotions and so on. From owning assets to owning international property, you know, the Airbnbs of the world, they don't own hotels or Uber and things like that. Lots of changes, okay? Changes in consumers and customers have led companies to undertake a lot of these changes. And I suspect that, you know, everybody had to do it. You had to do it as well. But here's my punchline. More is coming. Yeah, we haven't seen anything yet. And if you actually go and look at, uh, you know, some of the new technologies coming out there, it's frightening. It really is frightening. You're gonna, you know, 50 years from now, people are gonna look at the digital revolution and say, that was a piece of cake compared to all these things coming. Artificial intelligence, robotics, nanomaterials, today's FT. 
today CFT has a beautiful story about how robots are taking over chefs. Robots are now cooking for us and so on. And the day will come when, you know, instead of having people cooking, we're going to have robots and so on. Synthetic biology, machine learning, virtual reality, new radical business models. You know, lots of stuff is coming our way, which implies what? You know, just when you thought, my God, I need a break. I need a deserved break from all this reorganization that I had to do in response to the digital revolution. You have to do it all over again. Which implies what? Well, the questions I should be asking is, you know, how do I prepare for the next wave, despite what I've done so far? But more importantly, how do we prepare the organizations for continuous transformation? I'm sure you've seen this, these curves before. The S curves and so on and so on and so on. I'm saying the same thing. The only difference now is the following. These S curves, uh, <laughs> you know, in the good old days, you go through a growth phase, 20, 30, 40 years, and then you say, okay, after 30 years, I need to transform myself. And then you go through another phase, 20, 30 years, and then you say, okay, 30 years, I need to transform myself. And who cares about the 30 year horizon? I'll be retired by then. So you undertake one transformation and you say, let the next generation take over the next transformation. Whereas now, what you are saying is that, you know, it's continuous, like two, three years, whoops, we need another one. Two, three years, whoops, we need another one. It's tough, isn't it? That's why I became an academic. <laughs> I don't have to do these things. But you do. And the question then is, okay, how? How can I, you know, prepare my organization for a journey of transformation? So I'm going to give you three ideas, just uh, to provoke you, just to think. The first is we need, as an organization, we need to institutionalize the attitudes and behaviors that will make you effective in responding to whatever disruption hits you. You don't know the disruption that's going to hit you tomorrow. You really don't. Nobody does. So how do you prepare for something you're not, you don't even know is coming? Well, prepare the organization to respond to whatever the disruption is. Now, two things there. The first is, what the hell does institutionalize mean? Insti what does institutionalize mean? And the best example I have of that is uh, the example of Sally Wright. I don't know if you know, Sally Ride actually died this year, but uh, the last year. Sally Ride was the first uh, US woman astronaut who was um, in, uh, back in 1982, I think, she was put on the space shuttle to go into space. Anybody knows, you know, yeah? Okay. So I, I, I lived in the United States in the 80s, and um, I remember this story. We, uh, she, the astronauts were getting ready to get on the space shuttle, and there was a, a press conference, lots of journalists. And I remember one of the journalists asking Sally Wright the following question. He said to her, Sally, do you think that this is a great day for American women, that finally we have a woman astronaut to, to, uh, to take uh, to space? And you know what Sally replied? She said, no, this is not the great day for American women. The great day will be the day when we put a woman to go into space and nobody notices it's a woman. Because it's so normal, it's so natural, we don't even notice. It's like going to the toilet, isn't it? Have you noticed that whenever you go to the toilet, do your employees say, there she goes again to the toilet? They don't notice these things because it's part of day-to-day -day life. This is what I mean by institutionalizing certain attitudes and certain behaviors. It's part of the DNA. It's part of the fabric of the organization. It's part of the culture, the structures, and the process of the organization so that these things happen and nobody notices. And what kind of things are we talking about? Well, what are these behaviors and attitudes that you need to institutionalize because they will make you effective in responding to any disruption? I think you know the answer to this one. Say more, say more, isn't it? The usual suspect, what are they? Allowing our employees to question things, to experiment and learn, to collaborate outside their silos, to be open to new ideas, to be comfortable with ambiguity, to respond quickly with autonomy. You know this stuff. And these are the things we need to put in the fabric of the organization to institutionalize them. But I'd like to give you one more that you not be aware of, that we've seen from academic research. A single attitude that I think is important for people thinking about disruption. And the point is, I'm going to give you this attitude, and the implication is we need to institutionalize this attitude in our culture. And what's the attitude? 
How should your people look at the disruption? As a threat or as an opportunity? Can I take a vote on this one? How many things we should make them see it as a threat? And how many things wrong we should make them see it as an opportunity? You're wrong. I'm sorry. It was a trick question, by the way. The correct answer is not on the slide. There's an academic study done in the United States, a PhD student at uh, Harvard Business School. His name is Clark Gilbert. Back in 2001, he went and looked at how the newspaper companies responded to the internet. He was trying to understand why is it that some of them were successful and some were unsuccessful in making the transition to digital. Three years of his life he spent testing hypothesis after hypothesis. You know, because in academia we have lots of ideas. Oh, you should do this, you should do that. If you want to digitally transform yourself, this is the way to do it. He tested everything. He could not find any of them supporting you know, the difference between success and failure. And he was getting desperate, this guy. You know, you don't get a PhD degree unless you find something. <clears throat> and in fact, his supervisor was Clay Christensen. Some of you may know Clay Christensen, the guy who came up with disruptive innovation, very famous for, and so on. In fact, uh, one of the hypotheses he tested was uh, Clay, Clay Christensen came up with a disruptive innovation theorem, theory, and then his solution to it is a company needs to create a separate unit to develop the disruptive innovation. So Clark, being his PhD student, went and tested that in the newspaper business. He went and said, well, the newspaper companies that created a separate division to move into digital, they must be the successful ones, whereas those that did not create a separate unit, they did not succeed. And he couldn't find support for that. And if you are a PhD student, that's bad news, you know that. Because he went back to Clay and said, professor, I don't seem to find support in the data for your theory. What do you think Clay told him? Take a closer look at the data. And then he spent another year taking a closer look and went back to Professor Clay and said, I can't find support. And he said, look, do you want to get a PhD, yes or no? <laughs> to his credit, this guy then looked at another variable and he found support for this one. And what was the variable? How did these newspaper companies frame the decision to face the internet? How did they look at it? And what he found was the following. All the companies that failed, what did they say? They said, oh my God, this online distribution of news is a big threat for us. It is cannibalizing our newspaper business. We need to do something. And they all fail. Framing it as a threat, they all fail. Whereas those that succeeded, you know what they said. Contrary to what most people expect, the companies that succeeded in their response did not view it, the internet as an opportunity. How did they view it? Well, they started out saying, oh my God, online distribution of news is a big threat for us. It's cannibalizing our business into something. But they didn't stop there. You know what else they said? It's a big threat, but it's also a great new opportunity for us. So can you see the difference now? Those that succeeded, how did they look at it? As a threat, and an opportunity. <gasps> you are all sitting there saying, and he got a PhD for that? <laughs> yes, this is the most beautiful insight I've seen in the management literature in the last 50 years. Why is it beautiful? To really appreciate it, you know, consider the following scenario. How many of you have been on safari in Africa? Okay, imagine the following scenario. You're out on, uh, on the savanna, you're watching the animals and blah, blah, blah. It's lunchtime, you take a break, you stop the Jeep, you sit by your Jeep, you're having your sandwich, champagne, jazz music in the background, very relaxed. Are you all very relaxed? Very relaxed. Nice, beautiful day. And then suddenly, out of nowhere, a big, vicious lion is about attacking you. It's coming your way. You have 10 seconds to leave. Can you see the lion? Yes. My question to you is, how do you look at the lion? As a threat or as an opportunity? <laughs> Well, you laugh. How do, we, how do we look at the lion? Do you look at, oh, Simba, the lion king. Let's take a photo. How do most human beings look at it? As a threat, of course. We're like, oh my God, you know. And, and you know, the moment we frame something as a threat, something wonderful happens to the human body. What happens? Adrenaline, which creates all these side effects. First of all, it wakes us up. It creates a sense of urgency, does it not? 
You don't sit there and say, okay, okay, let me finish my sandwich and then I'm going to deal with the lion. It's like the lion becomes priority number one, creates a sense of urgency, galvanizes people, and mobilizes resources. But along with the positives come the negatives. And what are the negatives? What do you do? The lion is upon you. It's a pound to pounds on you. What do you do? What do you do? We run. Do you sit there and say, oh, let's think about this strategically, <laughs> right? How should I respond to the lion? Hmm, let's think now. One possible response is I run this way. Another possible response, I don't run, I pick up a knife and I fight with the lion. Another possible response, I don't fight, I don't run, I pick my wife, throw her to the lion and then run. <laughs> you see what happens? We don't think. You put people under a threat framing, they panic. What do they do? We stop thinking, we become very short-term oriented, and we become very reactive. Do you see now why the newspaper companies that frame the internet as a threat, they all failed? They all failed because on the one hand, they galvanized the organization by creating a sense of urgency, but then everything they did was short-term oriented, reactive, non-thinking. Every strategy they developed was stupid. And that's what happens in organizations when you create a burning platform. Have you heard that BS before? We need to create a burning platform here. Really? <laughs> Have you ever been on a burning platform? <laughs> Would you like to be on a burning platform? A burning platform creates a sense of urgency, fine, that's a positive, but then what else? People panic. They jump into the sea to save themselves. Is that what you want? Of course not. We should not be creating burning platforms for our people. So, when you frame something as a threat, it has certain positives, it has certain negatives. The same thing happens when we frame something as an opportunity. It makes us long-term oriented, it makes us proactive, it makes us think and think strategically. But then what's the negative? We think about all these things, and then what do we say? We need to respond to the internet, and here's the business plan how to respond. Have you heard people say that? We need to respond to the, we need to respond. To, do you know what they mean when they say we? Yes. yes, they mean you, yes. Because they are very busy themselves. Every time you hear the word we, people mean you. And of course you sit there and you agree with them. Yes, I agree, we really must respond, yeah. Who do you mean when you say we? Yes. Them, yes. They mean you, you mean them, and who ends up doing it? Nobody, exactly, yes. That's what you get when you think of it as an opportunity. Lots of good plans, lots of ideas, long-term thinking, and no urgency to do anything, nothing. It all stays in the, in, the, in the plan. So what does that imply? If you frame it only as a threat, you get the urgency, but the actions you take tend to be short-term oriented and reactive. On the other hand, if you frame it only as an opportunity, you will think that about it strategically, but there could be no urgency to act. So what's the best way to frame it? A threat and an opportunity to create the urgency and also to get people thinking and so on. Can I, I I'm a big fan of helping people visualize what we say. I think people understand what you say when you help them visualize it. So let me tell you, the same story, how a senior, a CEO of a telecom company told it to me. He said, why is it, he said, that all the new markets in the telecom industry over the last 20 years have been created, not by the established firms, but by new startup firms? Why is that? He said, why? I'm a big telecom company, I have the resources, I have the marketing, I have the government on my side, I have the technology, I should be creating markets. Why? Why not me? Why is it the startup firm that created the new markets? And then he drew this for me. He said, look at that. The big circle is me, the big company with all the markets, the, and the customers, and suddenly the new thing comes along. Now notice one thing. When the new thing comes along, it is small relative to my business. So it's natural to ignore it or underestimate it. But more importantly, you know what the, the killer is? When the new thing arrives, it's of little interest to my customers. Can you see that? When the new thing arrives, it kind of attracts a different customer from my core customer, which implies what? When I go to my customers and I say, hey guys, do you want me to offer you the new thing? You know what they say? 
No. My own customers lead me in the wrong direction. So I don't invest. I don't invest in the new thing. And then what happens? Well, what happens is that over time, the new thing improves itself. And as it improves, it attracts more customers. And then more. And then more. And notice what happened there. Some of my customers, for the first time, they look at it and they say, you know, it's good enough. And they switch. Can you see that? A little bit of my customers switching. And I see that. I say, hmm, that's very interesting. I better keep an eye on this one, eh? And then more of them, and then more of them. And suddenly, I look at the thing and say, wait a minute. This new thing is cannibalizing my market. I need to do something. And what do I do? I focus all of my attention on what? On that cannibalization of my core market. And I'm trying to defend against it. And in defending against the cannibalization, what do I forget? I forget the huge new market that got created in the periphery of my market. You see, I focus all of my attention to defend against the threat to my core business and forget about exploiting the opportunity next to my core business. And then he asked me, this new thing cost us. Is it a threat or is it an opportunity? Can you see it now? It's both, isn't it? A threat and an opportunity. It's a threat to the core business, and, which raises some interesting strategic issues, by the way, one of which, I, mean, I don't have time to talk about that, but think about it. If you have to defend and attack, that's basically what it says. I have to defend against the threat and attack. Can you do it with one strategy? Can the organization defend and attack with one strategy? And as I, I'll put my neck on the line and say that 95% of the time, you can't do it with one strategy, which implies what? Responding to disruption requires two strategies, a strategy of defending and a strategy of attacking, but that's, that's another story. So is the new thing a, a threat or an opportunity? And all I'm saying is that it's an attitude that we have to institutionalize and put it in the DNA of the organization. It's not a threat, it's not an opportunity, it's a threat and an opportunity. And, you know, along with that, don't forget all the other behaviors that I talked about, okay, that you need to institutionalize, the outdoor looking, autonomy, the experimenting, and so on. Second point that uh, I want to leave you with is the following. The importance of the organizational environment in determining how agile you become. Let me give you an academic study done by this uh, guy in the United States, George Lab. He developed a tool. It's a diagnostic tool that allows you to evaluate yourself or others how creative they are. You know, it measures how divergent your thinking is, okay? So he will give you this test. It's a test. a test of 10 questions. And if you score 10 out of 10 on this test, uh, you label a genius in creativity, right? So before giving this test to managers, he said, let me try this on young children. He developed the diagnostic tool specifically for young children and gave the test to a group of three to five-year-old kids. Now my question to you is, what percent of these kids do you think score as geniuses in creativity? 10 out of 10, not just good in creativity, geniuses. What number would you throw up? What percent of them? 90? Anybody higher than 90? 100. You're thinking of your children now? or <laughs> You know what the number was? 98% score a genius. Are you surprised? No, kids are creative, huh? Now, here's the interesting thing. He followed those kids over time now, and five years later, they're now 8 to 10 year old. He gives them another test similar, adjusted for age. Think about it, please. It's the same children. He did not change the kids. The same sample of kids, they're just now five years uh, uh, older. How many of them score as genius in creativity? Do you think you went down? Really? You're thinking of yourself now or your children? Yeah. How down? Give me a number. Be courageous now. Throw a number at me. 60%, that low, eh? Anybody else? 30? That part, who said 30? 30%, huh? Well done. 32%. 32%. What the hell happened? What happened? Yes, they went to school. Stop sending the kids to school. Unless it's London Business School. We don't do these things, you know. It's not just school, by the way. You see in a moment. And then he said, well, this is very interesting. Let's try this on teenagers. So he followed these kids again for another five years. 
They are now teenagers, huh? Same children, now teenagers, non-conforming, revolutionary. They never listen to mom and dad. What percent of them do you think score as geniuses in creativity? How many think it actually went up now because they are teenagers? Okay? And how many actually went down? How about the same? It actually went down to where? Ten percent. And then for fun, he said, oh, let me try this on a group of adults. Adults being anybody over the age of 25. Huh? Anybody in this room over that age? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what percent of them do you think? One. One. That bad, eh? You're thinking of your company now. <laughs> Two percent. Two percent. My God. It's a disaster, isn't it? And you look at these things and say, who are we going to blame? And everybody blames the educational system. They blame me. <laughs> Guess what? I'm not to blame. I'm not to You know why? You know, if you go back by the age of eight or 10, the majority of education that takes place, takes place where? Home, yes. Even by the age of 10, they became zombies, so don't blame me. <laughs> you know, blame mom and dad. It's not just the educational system, you see. It's not just education. What is it? It's the education system. It's the home environment. It's a playground. It's society. It's the work environment. It's all these things. It's the underlying environment, however you define it. The underlying environment has a big effect on how people behave. And what do I mean by environment? It's not just culture, you see. In an organization, the environment is made up of four primary things. Yes, culture and values are important, but so are the measurement and incentives we use. What gets measured gets done. That's part of the environment, the metrics that we use, short-term versus long-term and so on, what do you evaluate? But also the structures and processes we put people in. They're also the kind of people you hire. This is the environment. And this is what creates behaviors in society and specifically here in organizations. Yeah. Why is this important? You know, before, my first point was, think about the behaviors you need to institutionalize in your organization. And what are these behaviors? Experimenting, looking outside, cooperating, questioning. You know, I always go and talk to CEOs, and they always tell me that. They say, oh, Costas, I need my people to try things out, to experiment more. You know, experimentation, and even if you make a mistake, it's okay, because a mistake is not a mistake, it's... Yes, you heard that BS too, you know, it's a learning opportunity. I want my people to get out of their silos, cost us my God. If only they step out of their little silos and talk to each other, it would be a gold mine, this organization. And I always say to these CEOs, have you told your people these things? I say, yes. Well, have you told them many times? Many times! And they still don't do it? What is wrong with them? I tell you what, I have a louder voice than you. Maybe I should tell them. What is wrong with people? You keep telling them, hey guys, experiment, try things out, be agile. And they never do it. Why not? Why not? I wonder, are they deaf? Are they stupid? No. It's because while telling them those things, we have created an environment that encourages totally something else. When you say to people, hey guys, experiment, experiment, try things out, don't be afraid of failure. In front of you, they're saying, yeah, ooh, that's a good one, boss. But behind them, you know what they're thinking? They'll say, yeah, I know a couple of my friends who experimented last year and they're still looking for a job. <laughs> yeah? Or people say, oh, I may be the boss, but feel free to question me. I'm not God. I make mistakes. So if you disagree with me, please, feel free to question me. And then, of course, people don't open their mouth. When even when they say, hear bullshit coming out of that mouth, they don't open their mouth. Why? Fear. What is that? Maybe the culture, maybe the incentives do not, do not encourage questioning. So stop treating people like idiots, telling them the behaviors you want, and then saying, oh, they're not doing it. Well, I wonder why they're not doing it. They're not doing it because you have failed to create the underlying environment for them. Yeah? The environment influences human behaviors much, 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 much more than we give it credit for. You know, there's 50 years of academic research in social psychology, and the people have estimated that on average, 
the environment could account for up to 70% of the variance in the behavior of human beings. 70% versus personality, which accounts for only 30%. The environment is much, much more important than we give it credit to. And I know that because whenever you become successful in life, what do we say? If somebody says, oh, you're really good, Costas. You've been very successful. Why? I'm so good. I'm so clever. It's the hair. It's something. I don't know. It's always about us. It's not about you. The reason you're successful, 30% is you, but 70% is your team, your culture, your organization. You see, there's a lot of research on this one. I mean, um, an academic looked at the top 50 rated analysts on Wall Street. And, uh, you know, they were listed in, in a magazine called Institutional Investor as the top 50 analysts on Wall Street. And then most of them got uh, offers from other investment banks. And this guy followed them when they moved companies. And guess what he found? What he found was their productivity immediately dropped once they left their company. It dropped below industry average and remained below industry average for five years after leaving their company. So you have to ask yourself, what happened there? One moment these guys are geniuses, the best of the best, and then they become idiots? Yes, they were always idiots. They just didn't know it, you see, because the organization carried them there, but they never gave it credit to it. And they left, and they get back, got back to normal. We always say that, you know. Uh, anyway, the environment is much, much more important. So... What it implies for me, it's not enough to simply ask your people to adopt the behaviors that we talked about. They know their behaviors. They're not the idiots. They read newspapers like you do. They read business reports like you do. They know what behaviors they need. The important thing is to go beyond telling them and creating the right organizational environment, the right incentives, the right measurements, the right culture and values and so on that promotes the behaviors you want. And how you create this kind of context or environment well, you know, I always ask people, think about your family. Those of you with children, do your children have values? Do they know what's right or wrong? Yeah. Do you have a culture at home? Well, how did you create that culture at home? Did you send the kids on an educational program at London Business School? <laughs> we could have one one-week program on, you know, values and so on. No. How do we create cultures and values? Through our day-to-day -day behaviors. That's what kids do. They watch mommy and daddy, how we behave, what do we say, and so on. And based on that, they form beliefs. That's exactly how you create an environment and organization. It's through our day-to-day -day behaviors. Imagine the power of all these senior people in an organization behaving in the ways that you want everybody else to behave. You want them to question things, you question things first. You want them not to conform, stop conforming first. You want them to get out of their silos, get out of your silos first. And so, you know that. Final thing I want to say, creating a supporting environment is not enough. It's important, but not enough. Why do I say that? Another academic study done at the Harvard Medical School. This is my favorite. And uh, I always like to talk about this study because I, I, I know from personal experience that it's true. What did they do, these guys? They, they examined patients that recently had a major heart operation. Yeah, major, major heart operation. And you know what the major finding of this study was? It was that 90% of these patients go back to the behaviors that got them in trouble to begin with within six months after the operation. Think about that for a moment, please. You go in, you're about to die, you have a major heart operation, you get out of it, and the doctor looks at you and says, Mr. Marquidis, all I'm saying is, uh, if you want to leave, when you go back home to Cyprus, stop smoking, Stop eating that deadly cheese of yours called halloumi. Yeah, you know that. And live a healthy life. The doctor tells you these things. You go back. What do you do? You stop smoking. You stop doing the stupid things. And how long does that last? Six months. Isn't that unbelievable? I find that unbelievable, isn't it? Because it's a credible threat, isn't it? This is not, uh, you know, from a credible source. This is the doctor that just saved your life. It's not just a business school professor telling you these things. It's, you know, the guy who just saved my life is telling me to stop smoking. What does that tell you, by the way, that 90% revert to the behaviors that got them in trouble to begin with? What does it tell you? Other than people are stupid? Change is hard. Change is hard. Change is hard. 
It is hard to change human behaviors, even by a little bit. That's why I always laugh with New Year's resolutions. Have you taken any New Year's resolutions this year? You know why they always fail, these New Year's resolutions? Because they involve change of behaviors. A, a New Year's resolution is saying to yourself, I'm going to change this behavior. And we think, oh yeah, I'm not going to be going to the pub every day from now on. You think that's easy? Well, think of it. The guy, the doctor told me to stop smoking or I'm going to die and I don't even do that. And you think I'm going to give up the pub? No way. Change human behavior is hard. And scaring people, as you saw, even when the scare is credible, it's not enough to galvanize them into sustainable action. Yes, it cre creates the one-time change, but it's not enough. It's depressing statistics, this one, isn't it? 90% of people, you know, you're thinking, oh my God, I thought I had a tough job going back to this organization, but it's uh, even tougher now. But I left something out of this study that should give you hope. Can you see what I left out? What did I not tell you about this study? Okay, it's about the heart problem. It's a specific, but I said something about this. What is it? Yeah, you see, I was, this was uh, testing my theory that your attention span is only 30 seconds. I'm trying to catch you there to see. What did I not tell you? 90% go back to their old behaviors, but 10% change sustainably for the good. So it's possible to change human behaviors, isn't it? It's, it's difficult, but it is possible. And the question is, how did they, how, why? Well, what's the difference here? Why did this 10% change their behaviors? and the other 90. Anybody has a hint? What do you think? Were they younger? Maybe you say, oh, they're younger courses, so they have more to live for, so they are, the incentives there are is to change. No, were they wealthier? Is it because I'm wealthy and I can afford to change? No. You know what the difference was? The difference was how the doctor framed the need for change to them. What do I mean by that? The 90% that did that, uh, kind of went back to the old behaviors. You know what the doctor told them? The doctor said, look, if you don't stop smoking, you will die. What is that framing? It's a threat framing. It's a threat framing and you scare people and you see the effect of that. Whereas the 10%, you know what the doctor said? The doctor said, look, I'm a doctor, I'm not God. If you don't change these behaviors of yours, you're gonna die. But I don't want you to think of it like that. I like you to think like this. When you go back home, do you want to spend the remaining years of your life being able to play with your grandchildren without pain? Would you like to be able to take long walks with your husband, your wife, into the forest, into the park, without having to carry an oxygen cylinder and a mask with you? Do you want to live the remaining years of your life in a high quality kind of way? Yes, then, then stop smoking. What is that framing, by the way? Well, there is a threat element there, which you don't need to really emphasize to these people because they know, yeah, yeah I'm going to die. But the emphasis is on the opportunity. What the, the other thing that it is, if you want to change, you need to make the need for change personal and emotional. Personal and emotional. You go and say, oh, we need to be agile. We need to be innovative. Why the hell should I be innovative? It may be good for you and your shareholders. Why should I, your employee, be agile or innovative or whatever. You want me to stop, you know, conforming. Why? What's in it for me? We need to make the need for change personal and emotional. And I, you know, you know the analogy from psychology, the rider and the elephant, the rider being the brain, you know, or the rational side of the human being that tells us what we should do versus the elephant, the emotional part. If you don't win the elephant, you don't win anything. You cannot achieve any change. You have to win the elephant. You have to make the need. And again, you see, how do you make the need for change, emotional and personal? And I always like one of these types, the storytelling is a very effective tactic, by the way, but the one tactic that I love is help people visualize the need for change. And let me give you an example of this. You're working for a pharmaceutical company and you keep telling people we need to be innovative, we need to be innovative. How do you help them visualize the need to be innovative? Well, bring into the organization a couple of customers, a couple of patients who sit there and say, you know, I was diagnosed with cancer, but thanks to your product 
so-and-so, I can now live another 20 years with my grandchildren and live a happy life. Show a video like that to your employees or the customer talking about how your product has made their life different or better. And then trust me, you don't have to give them a PowerPoint presentation as to why you need to be innovative and so on. The same with customer centricity and all these things. Help them visualize why and use stories as well. Okay, so I said to you, I'm going to give you three basic ideas about this. One is the importance of institutionalizing uh, attitudes and behaviors that enhance our agility. Institutionalize it. Put it in your culture. Put it in your processes. Put it in your structures so that they happen without even you being around to notice them. Second, think about the underlying environment, please. It's environments that create behaviors. Environment is not just culture. I'm, I'm an economist by training, so I always look at the underlying incentives in a system, but culture is also very, very important. So think about the underlying environment. And second, and third, think about the need to make the change personal and emotional. And let me leave you with one last thought. Will you do any of these things? Will you do any of these things? <laughs> I'm pessimistic about that one, I'm afraid. That's why we exist as a business school, by the way, but that's another story. Will you do it? You know, let me just give you a couple of examples of what do I mean by that. We have been teaching organizations the need to introduce radical change. Personally, I said to you, I've been doing it for 27 years. And what's say, among the many lessons that we teach them, what's say one that I always stand out in my mind is the, is the importance of undertaking change before you really need it, yeah? You tell people, look, don't wait to catch the disease to go to see the doctor. Go beforehand. Have a checkup. You never know. The same with organizations. You go into companies and say, look, guys, this is a theoretical scenario. Profits go up and then they go down. When is a good time to change? Yeah. The people always say, all the time. All the time. But even a day. Question and change. Yeah. Don't wait for B. They always say that. Don't wait for B because it's the worst time. B is when the lion attacks. We panic and everything we do is short-term oriented and reactive and non-thinking and so on. Don't wait for big causes. They tell me that. And you know what? when they do it? We teach these things. I teach this to my MBAs every day of my teaching experience. And then you go and look at the evidence and what's the evidence? 85% of companies undertake change, not at point A, but at point B. I say, what is wrong with you people? You paid all this money to come to London Business School. I taught you these things. Maybe you didn't understand what I was saying. No. It's one thing to know, another thing to do. I'll give you another one. We have been teaching organizations that when they enter a new market, they should never attack head on. Never imitate. This is one of my things, you know. If you enter a new market, remember, it's a new market, but for whom? For you. There's somebody else in that market. Unestablished players or players with core competences and so on. And we have the evidence which shows that if you attack them head on, they will crush you. The people that win when they enter a new market is the people that enter with a differentiated strategy. They will tell them, attack like a guerrilla. Is it a difficult message to understand? Do I need to write a whole book on the bloody thing? <laughs> Yet I have written one, and I'm sure you're gonna go <laughs> and, and read it and so on. No, we tell these things to people and guess what? Research shows that 92% of our entries is imitative. Isn't it amazing? I love these kind of things, you know, because it means that people have to come back again and again and again <laughs> to London Business School. You know, it's amazing, isn't it? Doesn't matter how many times you tell people, they go, can I have it again? Yeah, you can have it again. <laughs> you know, yeah, but you told my senior ex, can you tell my middle boy? I can't tell anybody, bring the kids along. I can't tell everybody, <laughs> you know, because you're not going to do anything <laughs> anyway. So I'll leave you with this thought. The problem in my mind is not knowledge. I will venture to suggest to you that maybe I use different buzzwords and different ways of looking, but I haven't told you anything you didn't already know. Yeah, but that's not the issue. Okay, you knew it. Will you do any of these things or even a little bit? And that is a challenge in my opinion, to be aware of this knowing, doing gap. I know, but I'm not doing and create this bias of action in your organization. So with that, Thank you and good luck.